Greetings. <clears throat> I want to just uh, walk you through uh, the steps to a sermon. And uh, this will especially uh, help you with uh, writing your sermon briefs that uh, you will be, uh, be using for the, uh, <clears throat> the end of the semester. Now, as we think about sermon preparation, there are some preliminaries that uh, <clears throat> we're not going to cover. And, and since I'm not for sure if you've had any kind of uh, uh, sermon preparation courses, any kind of a hermeneutical course, then I want to just touch on some things very briefly. <clears throat> that, uh, you're going to select your passage for study, and then uh, we're going to look at some sermon organization. Now, as you uh, prepare to, uh, to, uh, uh, to write a sermon, you're going to have to do some studying. And uh, there's a couple of uh, special areas that you really need to focus on. <clears throat> One is studying the context uh, of the text. Every text has some kind of historical context. You know, if it's in the Old Testament, <clears throat> it, it may be from the time of the Exodus. It may be from the time of the captivity or a pre or post captivity New Testament. <clears throat> You're going to be looking at the first century. Uh, you may be looking at uh, the Gospels, you may be looking at Paul's epistles, general epistles. Uh, all of those have a, a historical context, and you need to be aware of that. They also have a cultural context. You need to know uh, information uh, perhaps uh, <clears throat> related to, to Pharaoh and what his, uh, uh, his role is and, and what uh, uh, the Egyptians uh, thought about him and uh, the, the Egyptian gods and what they represent. Uh, you get to the New Testament, then uh, <clears throat> you're going to need to be familiar with things like the uh, Pharisees, the Sadducees, synagogues, the, the temple. Uh, <clears throat> you're going to need to know the geography of, of a lot of that, uh, that kind of land and culture. And then you need to be aware of the literary context. And just very briefly, what this is, is you have your main passage. That's kind of the center of your uh, of, of your study but you need to go back and say well how is it related to the verses the paragraph or a couple of paragraphs before my uh, <clears throat> my my uh, passage and how is it related to those that come after my passage how, how does it relate to the entire book and I really wish we had more time to, to look at this but we don't uh, then you're going to need to analyze the text. You're going to have to turn into the text itself. You need to know that there's different kinds of genres in the Old and New Testament. Uh, you know, you've got the Old Testament history with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, you have uh, you have the, uh, the the writings, uh, the, the poetry. Uh, and, and the prophets, the major prophets, minor prophets. You, you study all of those in, in a different perspective. You get to the New Testament because you've got the Gospels, you've got Acts, you've got uh, Paul's epistles, general epistles, Revelation. So you need to do some study of the genre, and there, there's lots of resources for that. <clears throat> and then uh, you need to do a word study. Now, word study is more than just giving a definition. Uh, a word study, you need to, to dig into the history of the word. Look at how it's used uh, throughout the entire Old Testament or New Testament. Uh, what kind of special uh, uh, changes ha have happened. <clears throat> and then you need to look at grammatical relationships, subject, verbs, preposition, participles. How do those sentences all, all uh, connect? <clears throat> and then you look at the mood and or the spirit of the text. What is it that's going on? Is, uh, is the writer... Uh, happy or are they lamenting or are they uh, they praising or or are they uh, experiencing sorrow and brokenness so uh, you, you want to be able to take care of all of that as you begin to uh, uh, prepare to uh, to write anything for uh, your uh, sermon or your sermon brief <clears throat> now there are some presuppositions that guide our analysis of the text I think, number one, we would agree that the Bible is God's word to man. That is, it's of divine character. God is the ultimate author of the Bible. <clears throat> we also know, though, that uh, he used the personalities of men to, to write down. And, uh, and so uh, it, it's, a, it's a, of a divine human kind of character. It should also be studied as a unified whole. We want to focus on God's redemptive message. We need to understand uh, <clears throat> how... God created uh, man to have fellowship with him. Man sinned, man fell, 
and rebelled against God. Therefore, it caused a problem, a division between God and man, and they couldn't have that fellowship again. But what was God's solution to that? Well, it was to send Jesus Christ, his son, into the world to redeem mankind from that lostness, from, from that separation, from his rebellion, that they might have fellowship once again for all eternity. <clears throat> we know some passages contain predictive importance. And because the Bible is divine revelation, miracles are accepted. We're not going to question those. We recognize the Bible is mediated through human personalities, as I've already said. <clears throat> and it's of utmost importance the interpreters seek to understand the author's intended meaning. What did the passage mean to its author? And we need to also, also how did the original readers uh, understand this passage? So if, if your, your interpretation and doesn't reflect what, to say, the Apostle Paul intended to say and what, say, maybe the Galatians understood, then your interpretation is off, okay? Uh, and again, Scripture has only one meaning, but it can have many applications. Now, here's the steps to the sermon. One of the first things you want to do is the title of the sermon. <clears throat> and this is often neglected. Some pastors don't even mention it. But, uh, but as the one that's preparing the sermon, you need to have, have a, a title. And what does it do? Well, it helps to formulate the essential message of the sermon. It allows the audience to clearly know your intentions. And it needs to, the sermon title needs to be in quotation marks using heading uh, capitalization style. And that basically is like what you see here. The is capitalized as the first word. Title is an important word. And sermon's an important word. Often they are not essential, important words per se. And so they will not be capitalized. <clears throat> Now, having said that you need this title, I know that sometimes it's easier to determine after the sermon's completed or even along the way, but I like to start with a preliminary title and then I can adjust it along the way. It needs to be clear, accurate, brief, relevant, and original. Uh, it's very seldom do you want to borrow somebody else's. And it's using an emphatic or unifying word can add to the title. Now, the text of the sermon, this is step two. If you're following expository evangelical kind of preaching that our textbook uh, talks about, uh, you would have been looking at the next passage in your study. For example, if you've been preaching through Romans, you finished Romans 3.23, and the verses following Romans 3.23 can become the text for your sermon. It might just be 3.24. It might be 3.24 through 26 or 3.24 through 28. Or well, however you want to divide that paragraph out. <clears throat> Oftentimes, like the New American Standard Translation, I think the NIV, ESV uh, put things into paragraphs, so you might want to just go paragraph by paragraph. And it goes without saying, you must especially rely upon the Holy Spirit's guidance in this, this stage. You've got to be vi vitally important that you're dependent upon the Spirit. You want to pray over the passage. And a consistent reading of the passage aids in becoming familiar with that passage. A preacher from a previous generation said he never felt ready to preach a text until he had read it at least 50 times. So the repetition makes you familiar with a passage so that you get the big picture, okay? And if, you, if you've done the, the uh, other textual study context, you know what's before it, you know what's after it, so you know where Paul's going. Step so number three is the topic of the sermon. This adds clarity, it helps to add uh, clarification for the sermon and the sermon idea. It serves as a general map to guide the sermon to its end. And usually the topic of a sermon is one or two words or a short phrase. And examples will be given later in the, uh, in the lecture. Step four, determine the essence of your text in a sentence. And, and that's just abbreviated ETS. And you'll find that in the uh, sample uh, uh, briefing that uh, that I, I give you and provide for you, and uh, and so uh, you want to just use that and just kind of remember it's the essence of your text. It's one clear, concise, declarative sentence expressing the central truth of the passage or text. You're focusing on the biblical text, okay? It's stated in the past tense because it's an attempt to summarize the biblical text, and you might even use some words of the text if that will be helpful shouldn't ex exceed 15 words. For example, John 3. Regardless of his character or his religious experience, Nicodemus needed a transforming experience of regeneration 
wrought to his life by the Holy Spirit of God. Now that comes out of the steps of the sermon. It's rather long, and I think it could be more concise. But but notice here, it's you're, you're really summarizing the the text. And again, remember the sermon begins with the text and connects its situation with that of the hearer. <clears throat> The ETS for Genesis 5.24 might be Enoch walked with God. Notice how simple that is. The ETS for Matthew 13.1-9, the parable of the soils might be Jesus illustrated how people listen to the gospel. Uh, ETS might be uh, for, for Luke 15.11-24, the younger son struggled with his self-image. Self-image is neither directly related to the passage or immediately obvious. Each text may have numerous other truths, but you will select one major truth and you will summarize it. Now, the ETS is resulting from a careful, diligent study of the text, and it serves as part of the process to move you to the proposition, uh, which is another stage of sermon construction. So the ETS. Three uses for the ETS. Studying the text for the ETS grounds a sermon in the biblical situation. We want to keep our sermon close to the biblical text. You're going to use the ETS to get a proposition, which is going to be summarized as ESS. Uh, the uh, ETS will be used as a guide for preparing a sermon. It will be used in the introduction and throughout the body of the sermon. It's not a waste of time. It's valuable to the process of sermon construction. <clears throat> five examples again. Uh, Genesis 5:24, Enoch walked with God. Mark 2, 1 through 12, Jesus helped a paralyzed man. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, Paul described Christians as God's workmanship. James 1, 19 to 26, James taught believers how to respond to God's word. Philippians 1, 19 to 26, Paul faced the reality of his death. Step number five, this is a term of the essence of the sermon in a sentence. We abbreviate that with ESS. Now this sums your sermon idea into one clear, concise statement, sometimes called a sermon proposition, and you'll see it sometimes called that. Now it's important that when you do an ESS that you do not state this in the past tense. You want to use the present or future tenses. Uh, that, uh, uh, and then we'll, we'll see examples of this. It connects the truth of the text to people's needs in a simple sentence. It's related to the ETS and furnishes the foundation upon what upon which the rest of the sermon is built. And the ES understands that it must be birthed from the biblical situation and the needs of people. The ESS or proposition is the essence of the sermon in a sentence. Now, some claim this is the hardest part of the sermon, but it's worth the time and energy put into it. You, you see, it's the sermon in a nutshell. It's, uh, it, it's, it's that sentence that you wish that your people could take home with them. If they can remember anything at all, it would be the essence of this sermon, this uh, ESS. Uh, the ES is necessary because every part of the sermon unfolds from it. It's the key to beginning your sermon. And out of the ESS comes your major divisions. It builds unity in your sermon. You will have one point and it will help you refrain from chasing rabbits. The ESS encourages good communication. You know where you're going, and you normally arrive at that destination. It connects the Bible and the needs of people. It uh, demands a careful and deliberate study of the text, and it should uh, possess the possibility of expansion. You're going to go from it to two, three, four points. There are six types of uh, ESS or propositions. You have the possibility. Shows optimism for life or the ability to attain a goal. Genesis 5.24, you can have a closer walk with God. Predictive, it foretells what will happen in a person's life. Genesis 5.24, your life will be blessed when you walk with God. And persuasive, it's an inducement to believe or do something. Genesis 5.24, God calls you to walk with him. Three others, four is comparative. It discloses similarities or differences. Walking with God differs from walking away from God. Evaluative ascertains the value or benefit of an action. Walking with God is the best way to live. And declarative, a statement of fact. Walking with God means to obey Him. Step number six is to determine the major objective of the sermon in a sentence. I call this MOS. It's a third simple, clear, uh, uh, 
sense in which you state specifically the action you want your hearers to take as a result of listening to the message. The total objective is to bring life to people. John 10, 10 says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I come that they might have life and have it abundantly. Now, there are six major objectives that you want to be aware of. We're going to focus on the evangelistic in this class, but uh, just for your own information, and you're probably aware of this, there are some others. Evangelistic preaching presents the gospel, the good news to those who do not know or who have not accepted it by faith. The devotional is directed toward Christians, the idea of causing them to love, to adore, to worship God. Doctrinal, used when to sharpen a discernment of God and his truth is needed. You can, it can stand alone, or you, sometimes this will be even added to the others, like evangelistic. Sometimes you got to explain what does it mean to be lost, what does it mean to be saved, what's salvation, what's regeneration. Another one is ethical, presents a creative challenge in almost any age, but especially our century. Shows that a true believer's faith touches the lives of his fellow men and women. Consecrative, seeks to meet the needs of believers to be fully committed to Christ. Supportive or pastoral, born of the sufferings and burdens of people in trouble. So those are your six MOS's major objectives of the sermon. An example here, Genesis 524. Topic, the best exercise, ETS, Enoch Walk with God, ESS, you can walk with God, major objective. Consecrative. The objective, my objective for my hearers, to live each day according to God's way. And this is uh, really the uh, objective of the sermon in a sentence. So that's OSS. Some others, Mark 2, 1 to 12, the topic, the miracle worker, ETS, Jesus helped a paralyzed man, ESS, Jesus helps people with their needs. Major objective, supportive. My objective is for people to experience Jesus help in their lives. Philippians 1, 19 to 26, facing your death, Paul faced the reality of his death. Non-Christians need to face the reality of their death. Major objective, evangelistic. My objective is for non-Christians to prepare for their death by repenting and expressing faith in the gospel of Jesus. Step 7, the OSS, objective of the sermon in a sentence. That's part of what we just went over. And this allows you to clarify the target of your sermon. You're going to state clearly what you want your audience to do once they have heard your sermon gives you that bullseye to know if your sermon has any hope of achieving its intended purpose. You're going to usually use a, a future tense action verb, and it needs to be connected to the title, the, the uh, major objective of the sermon, and the outline of the biblical text. Examples, my hearers will respond by faith to the gospel. My audience will show understanding of the message by completing a survey card. It will indicate by raised hand the need for the pastor to pray for their needs. We'll share the gospel with at least one person this week. Step eight, ask probing questions of the ESS, the proposition. This leads to the selection of a unifying word. Major divisions of your sermon will emerge as you are probing questions of the ESS. And this unifying word will hold the divisions together. You develop the body of the sermon using the proposition or the uh, essence of the sermon in a sentence. You ask questions like who or whom, what, why, how, which, when. And for your sermon, select only one of those probing questions. Example one, probing question, what is missions? Unifying word, truths. Transitional sentence, let us notice some biblical truths about missions. And we're going to talk about these a little bit later as well. The first truth is that God wants to save the world. The second is that God wants to use every believer in the saving, saving the world. And the truth is God wants to give power for missions. Next one eight. Why should Christians be involved in missions? You can find word reasons. Transitional sense. Let us examine some reasons why Christians should be involved. First reason, the Lord commands mission involvement. Second reason, the world needs mission involvement. Third reason, the Holy Spirit empowers missions. Uh, we can look at it another way. How can Christians be involved in missions? Again, key words, ways. Let us apply some ways Christians can be involved meaningfully in missions. First way is to offer prayer support. Second way is to send others as missionaries. Third way is to give money and support to missionaries. Fourth way is to witness where we live. So step nine, the unifying word. We've seen some examples of that, but it brings the main division of the sermon together, guaranteeing unity. Each unifying word is always a plural noun or a plural noun form of a verb. Using the plural form allows the coverage of all major divisions. 
using a singular set, sets each major division apart, and use a good thesaurus or collection of antonyms or synonyms to uh, find these unifying words. Sep 10's transitional sentence, uh, this is the body of, of the sermon. Uh, good transitional sentences have value for the sermon. They rescue from obscurity. They help you know where you have come and where you're going. They test the unity of the sermon. They link the introduction to the rest of the sermon's major divisions. And they help the sermon make progression. It helps keep the audience's attention and interest. You have three types of transitions. Relational. This uses a conjunction to show relationships. The believer may be anxious about death, but the believer has a hope for life after death. Facing death brings this observation, but there is another one. Connecting word and or phrase, verse, second, third, moreover, furthermore, next, after that, on the contrary. And then the question transition. Why does Jesus want to help us? Well, let us notice, and then you can give two or three reasons. Putting it all together, we're going to have a couple examples here, and this is what you're going to have on your uh, uh, sermon brief, uh, except uh, you're going to have your own uh, work, and then the outline is going to be fuller than what we have here. But the title, God's Work with Masterpieces, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, the topic, God's Masterpiece, the ETS, Paul described Christians as God's workmanship, ESS, Christians are God's Masterpieces, major objective is supportive. The OSS, my hearers will recognize they have the potential of being one of God's masterpieces. Probing question, what does the text disclose about God's masterpieces? Unifying word, disclosures, and transitional sentence. Let us study the disclosures of the text about God's masterpieces. And then you see the outline. Here's a second sample for you. I'm not going to read that all to you, but you can read it, study it, look at it. And under each of the major points of the outline, you're going to need to include the explanation, the illustration, and application. The explanation is the heart of your study. This rearranged material to support the point of your outline. You're going to want to stay close to the text. Don't stray off to other verses in the text. Illustration. These are needed to reach today's uh, picture movie-oriented society. You're going to use these to clarify the essential truths. Jesus modeled the use of illustrations with stories and parables, etc. Uh, there will also be other lectures that touch on the use and gathering of illustrations. And then application, seek to show out of here needs to be, do, think, speak as a result of your major point. And these are some of the resources that I use fairly heavily for this lecture. And uh, these are a couple of good books. They're older, but uh, they help uh, really help you put together a sermon. Remember, I'm praying for you. If I can help you, just let me know. God bless you.